Hello, brothers and sisters. It is a great day to study the Word of God. I invite you all to join me in exploring through the Bible. Before we go into our study for today, I would like to briefly recap our last lesson. Our deliberation earlier was that Dr. Luke wrote his gospel with a twofold purpose. First, his purpose was literary and historical. Of the four gospels, Luke's gospel is the most complete historical narrative. There are more wide-reaching references to institutions, customs, geography, and history of that period than found in any of the other gospels. Secondly, his purpose was spiritual. He presented the person of Jesus Christ as the perfect divine man and savior of the world. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Luke stresses the fact that Jesus was the perfect man. This was a time when the Greeks attempted to perfect humanity and to develop the perfect man. Though their culture, language, and philosophy were the finest ever developed, the Greeks fell short of perfecting humanity. It was in this context that Luke presents the perfect divine Son of God as our great high priest. Touched with the feeling of our infirmities, able to extend help, mercy, and love to us, he wrote to the Greek mind and to the intellectual community. Leaving our recap at that, brothers and sisters, I warmly welcome you again to another session of Digging into the Word of God. Welcome to Through the Bible, our time together around the holy warmth of God's holy word. Our study today is based on the gospel according to Luke chapter 1. Like a compass, the Bible points us in the right direction. Historically, Dr. Luke begins his gospel before the other synoptic gospels. Heaven had been silent for over 400 years when the angel Gabriel broke through the blue at the golden altar of prayer to announce the birth of John the Baptist. Luke gives us the background as well as the births of John and Jesus. Three songs are in this chapter. One, Elizabeth's greeting of Mary, verses 42 to 45. The second song, Mary's Magnificat, verses 46 to 55 of Luke chapter 1. And the third song, Zacharias's Prophecy, verses 68 to 79. Notice verse 1, friends, of Luke chapter 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Two words are important in this passage, verses 1 to 4 of Luke chapter 1. And these two words should not be passed over. One is the word eyewitness. In the Greek it is autoptai auto, meaning that which is of itself. And opsomai meaning to see. To see for yourself would be an eyewitness. It is a medical term. Luke, being a doctor, uses a lot of medical terminology, which means autopsy. In fact, what Dr. Luke is trying to say 
we are eyewitnesses who made an autopsy and I am writing to you about what we have found. The second important word Dr. Luke uses is the word ministers which is the Greek huperatai meaning an under rower on a boat an under rower on a boat in a hospital situation the under rower is the intern dr luke is saying that all of them were just interns under the great physician beautiful isn't it what dr luke is telling us is that a physician and a scholar had made an autopsy of the records of those who had been eyewitnesses. The first four verses of this chapter form a tremendous beginning. Dr. Luke wrote his gospel to give people certainty and assurance about the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, wherever you are, how much assurance do you have? Do you know that you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know that the Bible is the Word of God? You see, Romans 10 verse 17, Faith comes by hearing the Word, and the Word is heard through the Word of Christ. If you really knew the Word of God, you would surely believe it. Those who are ignorant of the Bible are the ones who have the problems. The problem is not at all with the Bible or with the Lord Jesus. The problem squarely lies on us. Notice verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. God, dear friend, breaks through after 400 years of silence. Chronologically, Dr. Luke begins the New Testament. As we mentioned earlier, he goes back to the birth of John the Baptist to where the angel Gabriel appeared to John's father as he served in the temple. Notice, John's parents were Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias means God remembers. Elizabeth means his oath. Together, their names mean God remembers his oath. Beautiful, isn't it? When did God take an oath? In Psalm 89 verses 34 to 37, there is a record of God's oath. Notice the oath. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever, and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky, Selah. Psalm 89, verse 34 to 37. God swore an oath to David, dear friend, that one of his descendants would have an eternal reign. Christ, Jesus Christ, is that descendant. God remembered his oath. God is ready to break through into human history after 400 years of silence. Notice now that the scripture tells us both Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous people. That is, that they were right. How were they right? They recognized they were sinners. 
and they brought the necessary sacrifices. Verse 6 of Luke chapter 1 Both of them, Elizabeth and Zechariah, were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Their walk commended their salvation. How much of this we need in this day and age? Does your walk commend your salvation? When they committed a sin or made a mistake, they brought the proper sacrifice. Beautiful, isn't it? Let's continue verse 7. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. Here is an old couple who did not have a child. Zechariah, belonging to the tribe of Levi, served in the temple, verse 8 to verse 12. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Verse 10 And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Zechariah was serving at the golden altar, the place of prayer. And you notice suddenly this angel appears from nowhere. If you saw an angel, what would you do? Your reaction would be the same as that of Zechariah's. You would be gripped with fear. You would also be startled. Verse 13 but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Now he hears these words. That would have been music to his ears. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Friends, the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah was to be a Nazarite. One of the things the Nazarite vowed was that he would not drink strong drink or wine. He was to find his joy in the Holy Spirit and in God. That is the reason Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Verse 16, Many of the people of Israel will he, John, bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was the message of John, wasn't it? Prepare the way of the Lord. Let us understand clearly now that although John the Baptist went forth in the spirit and the power of Elijah, he was not Elijah reincarnated. John would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He, in other words, was a bridge to the generation gap. Verse 18, Zechariah Asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. 
Have you ever prayed like that? You ask God for something, but you really do not believe He is going to give it to you. Verse 19 now. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Imagine how the heart of Zechariah would have leapt. I stand in the presence of God, Zechariah, and now I am standing in your presence. The word of God has the seal of God upon it, and the word of God carries God's own authority. Verse 20 And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Friends, Zachariah, who was so vocal, will be dumb for a period of time. Unbelief is always dumb. That is, unbelief never has a message. I agree with Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who said that one without faith should be silent. Verse 21 now. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. Verse 22. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. God, after four hundred years of silence, once again breaks through to the human race. But the very man that he communicates with does not believe him. Interesting, isn't it? And now he is made dumb. Can you imagine his trying to explain to the people that he is dumb? How would you make known to the people that you had seen an angel and now that you cannot talk? It would definitely not be easy. Verse 23. When his time of service was completed, he, Zechariah, returned home. Long ago, King David had arranged that the priests in the temple would serve a certain period of time. Then they would take a break. One priest would serve, then have some time off and another priest would serve. When his vacation time came, he still had to keep quiet. So I imagine he went home and listened to what Elizabeth had to tell him. After this, verse 24, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace. Being barren was a disgrace during that time. Has taken away my disgrace among the people. This is an interesting situation we have here. Zacharias cannot talk. Elizabeth became, because of her condition, remains in seclusion for several months. Now verse 26. And in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, the descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. We move now, friends, from Jerusalem to Nazareth. Six months after the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, he appears now to Mary. Two times in one verse, notice she is called virgin. A virgin is a woman who could never have a child 
in a natural way because she has never experienced a physical relationship with a man that would make the birth of a child possible this must be defined friends the scripture makes it clear that the lord jesus was virgin born it should be remembered that luke was a doctor and he gives the most extended account of this virgin birth verse 28 the angel went to her and said greetings you who are highly favored the lord is with you mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be then verse 30 but the angel said to her do not be afraid mary you have found favor with god you will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name jesus and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high the lord god will give him the throne of his father david and he will reign over the throne of jacob forever his kingdom will never end this is plain language friends there is no way of misinterpreting it this passage is quite literal those people who deny the virgin birth also do not believe that the lord is going to sit on the throne of his father david apparently it was understood that what luke is writing about is literal the virgin's womb is literal friends and the throne of david is literal he shall literally reign over the house of jacob and of his kingdom there shall be no end the kingdom is also literal and a reality mary asks now in verse 34 how will this be since i am a virgin mary was the first one to have a question on virgin birth not you and me she said how can it be this is still a good question dr luke quotes the angel gabriel and gives us the answer to all our speculations verse 35 is the crux friends the angel answered the holy spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you so the holy one to be born will be called the son of god friends no man had anything to do with the birth of jesus christ this is our concluding statement of our study today mary is told that she is not bringing a sinner into the world he is holy the union of man and woman can only produce a child with a sin nature but the virgin birth is the only way god could get that holy thing into the human family psalm 51 and verse 5 david said surely i was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me Mary's son would be different dear friends he would be virgin born you can deny the virgin birth if you want to do you know dear friend why this baby is going to be called the son of god because he is the son of god remember that dr luke approaches his gospel from a scientific medical point of view he states that he examined jesus of nazareth and his findings are that jesus is god luke came to the same conclusion that john came to in his gospel though their procedure and techniques are different we conclude with verse 38 i am the lord's servant mary answered let us respond even as we close our meditation for today with the words of mary may it be to me as you have said 
then the angel left her. Dear friends, I would like to recall for all of us the words in Colossians 1 verse 16. It reads, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. I believe this was what God was exactly continuing to do when he sent his angel Gabriel to both Zechariah and Mary. God has a plan. They seem to have happened just like that. But God's calendar would have had this incidence right from the beginning. Now what makes even more interesting and beyond us is when God has a plan. Nothing would stop its part of execution. There is absolutely nothing that is impossible to God. As all things are created through Him, no power or dominion can stand against Him. And as His wisdom initiates these plans, the timings are perfect as the world sees His love unfolds. So the right question to ask ourselves today is, are we willing to be available for God's mission and undertakings in this world? Will you and I be obedient to His biddings? I believe you were blessed and encouraged by the things we learned today. I hope to see you again in our next study. God bless you. Thank you.